Welcome to the United States of America. If you conduct yourself well, you can consider us friends. Hello, this is Chris Pratt from Eurogamer, joined by Mr. Ed Beach, the lead designer on Civilization VI. Correct. And also, you're the lead designer on the uh, two Civ V expansions. Right, both Gods and Kings and Brave New World. Right, and that has people very excited about what you're going to do with Civ VI because... We have plans. People like those expansions, you know? Good. They went down pretty well. Um, and, yeah, just, I guess, what does it mean to be the lead designer on a Civilization game? I mean, we... This is the 25th anniversary of the series, right? Right, so no pressure. <laughs> yeah, um, like what kind of stamp are you hoping to put on on this particular... What we really issue? want to do is we want to um, not throw away anything that we did with Civ Five mm -hmm. because Civ Five has been received very, very well, and sure. there are lots of people who love it. But there were things that we couldn't do with Civ Five. Just once we started down that path, we knew that you know, there was only so much change we could introduce at once, or sure. there were things that... Um, we're too risky to try at the same time we were moving all the combat out into separate tiles. So we want to kind of get a chance to experiment and explore those fun new directions that we uh, had had in mind that we hadn't got, had a chance to put in place yet. We um, really want to make Civ VI the game where the map becomes the star. Right. I mean, I think it always has been to some extent <laughs> in the Civ game, but now the, like, the map is going to be just your friend and your ally. and. If you look at the visual style that we have for the game, it's based on cartography mm -hmm. and sort of the age of exploration. Yeah, I like the fog of war stuff you got going look. on. Look, yeah, and, and that's not accidental. That's sort of the, like a signature element for Civilization VI is uh, you have to play the map. You have to look at the exact terrain around each of your cities, decide how your cities are going to sprawl across the map. And so the visual style just sort of reinforces that. With, with Civ Five, um, it's, it is a very well regarded civilization game, but I think people do tend to talk about it as a complete package with the expansions. Um, is that something you're wary of, of repeating again? Like the, the base game um, with Civ Five, uh, it needed those expansions, I, th I think it was fair to say. Uh, absolutely, because number one, one of our first decisions was the systems from the Civ Five expansions are coming back. Okay. So we still have. Even something as esoteric as like the archaeology system, mm -hmm. um, the great work system, the new culture victory from Brave New World, the trade yep. routes, religion, all those things are all coming back. Uh, we've made the announcement that there's one system that we're not putting into play right away, which is the World Congress system. Right. Um, but that's a system that the way we put that together was looking at lots and lots of Civ Five games and sort of thinking on a meta level and analyzing it. and. You know, that's the kind of thing where we have to have some more time with with a brand new game to understand how that would even work. Is, is is that what the expansions are then, in a way? Like giving, like you you put the base game out there, you see how the community reacts to it, and then it gives you the time to be like, and now we can do this fun thing or this thing. I that think that's missed. actually a good way to do the expansions. Okay. Is and and actually that's a good way to do any of the games in the series is to take a really hard look at what's working and what's not working in the previous title. And we did a lot of that with Civ Six. Cool. Um, even though I said we kept religion and we kept archaeology, every single system was built from scratch for Civ VI. We had code, a code base that had actually started with Civ IV right. and got brought forward into Civ V. We sure. reused some of the Civ IV things, leveraged that to get Civ V going. But that meant that if we we're going to keep using that same code base for <laughs> Civ VI, it was going to have you know 10-year-old code, sure. and stuff that maybe even older than that. And, and we had to update everything. We wanted to be able to support modding um, in a whole new way with our gameplay systems mm -hmm. and the ability to just rebuild everything exactly the way we wanted it um, has, has really helped us uh, put, it, put us in a really, really good spot for moving forward with the game. So that gave us also an opportunity. That was uh, you know, a chance for, we absolutely want that religion system from Civ Five. But it doesn't have to be exactly the same. Sure. If there's anything that needs to be tweaked, anything needs to be cut out because it wasn't working quite right, some new idea, some ideas maybe we had had for Civ Five but hadn't had time to put in, those all got put. The, the, all those adjustments got made this time. Uh, can we talk about some of those adjustments? It feels like you're the right guy to uh, sure. talk to because you, you know, you led those expansions yes. and now you're leading this one. So when you look at something like the religion system. What that extra time that that this new game? What what does that give you? So the there's, there's going to be a big reveal on the religion system coming in maybe a month's time. Okay, but I can talk about some of the little tweaks. Sure. Um, so for instance, one of the things that the fans had mentioned to us that the Civ Five system didn't do was if you locally had started worshiping or 
worshiping a pantheon of gods and you had a pantheon of belief in place, yep. when a major religion came and swept over you and maybe you weren't pushing a re major religion yourself, those pantheon beliefs were wiped out. Right. And they thought it was actually probably truer to life in terms of the way religion worked in the real world is if, like, when Christianity came to Latin America, a mm -hmm. lot of the interesting Latin American beliefs um, were preserved and they sort of merged them yeah, in with absolutely. Christianity. And so it, it was actually probably a better um, system if we had had it so that the Pantheon beliefs had stayed in place and just the beliefs of the major religion were added on top of it. Uh, but we didn't build Civ Five that way. And yep. like the fans said, you know, um, uh, I would have liked it to work like that. So for Civ Six, we absolutely did it that way. That sounds so that's exactly how it works. Very, very cool. But from a gameplay perspective, how do you make that work? Like, what? How do you represent that? Um, what you have is every city has a little detailed display of its religion mm -hmm. and what's going on there, and it includes just two separate entries for what what beliefs it's getting from the Pantheon. Right, right. So it, it wasn't a big deal to to do that. Cool. Um, I guess moving on to some of the the wider changes with, with Civ Six. You mentioned that like the map is the the key here, and I completely get what you mean because I guess it's specifically representing the buildings on the map um, is is a real shift for Civ Six. So right. you've got things like districts and the fact that you can you know a, a wonder takes a tile, it fills a tile when you build it. Right. Why why was that important to you? What do you think that adds to civilization? Well, I think. That one thing is you look at the Civilization V map, mm -hmm. there was a lot of repetition in terms of how it was used. You could have an awful lot of farm, 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 trading yep. post, trading post, trading posts. Um, and so it was very, uh, the decisions weren't very interesting in terms of how you're going to improve tiles. Um, there, there weren't that many different choices to make. And um, that's just a lot of room on the map yeah. where there wasn't anything really <laughs> sure. interesting going on. And it wasn't, you didn't care about those tiles to protect each and every one of those tiles. Mm -hmm. You know, you could let the barbarians or another civ come in and destroy that. It didn't really matter yep. to you. If we all of a sudden take the cities apart and spread them out across the map, all of a sudden, now those are your precious buildings that are out there on the map exposed to an invading army. Okay. You care about them a lot. If we also change it so that exactly which ones are positioned where, is very important because there are adjacency bonuses is what we mm -hmm. call it for uh, putting a district in the right location. All of a sudden, even if you're not under a threat of invasion, just to try to build the strongest empire and get the most bonuses and get through the game faster, you're really thinking through exactly what the, the terrain around your map is giving you. And it just makes the game a, a lot more interesting. We, we, right. we actually put that in place like as the first change we wanted to try out for Civilization VI. We immediately, there was never a version of Civilization VI where all the buildings went into the city. We, we spread them out right from the beginning and it was working right away. We cool. just had, it was fun. Um, it changed all of our thoughts about um, the different types of terrain. It used to be that mountains were sort of a forgotten tile in Civilization V. You, you couldn't really do anything with them. They just sort of got in your way. You yep. didn't really like having them near you. Yep. Now mountains are great. Yeah, I see. We, we love having mountains there. And, and I have people who tell me, you know, the only thing that's going to cause me to re-roll a game and, and start <laughs> over mountains. is if I don't have mountains near me. <laughs> I like that the, the, those are the kind of fundamental uh, impacts that your decisions end up having. Right. And mountains it's, it's, become it's important. Fun, you make mountains to, important. You know, have our testing group come back to us and, yeah, and tell we're us We're really into mountains now. So yeah, exactly. And it's like, okay, that yeah. change is working. Um, I mean, I, I saw a little bit of that. I've just played uh, 60 turns in the, the demo E3, and yeah, I had only had four cities, but they were already looking very different, and it gives a certain personal attachment to where you've placed things, and the, the fact that the city is, looks like something you've made. Um, yeah, and the other big thing that enforces you to kind of customize each city differently is the way our district rules work. Yep. So you can only build um, a certain number of districts based on what your population is. Pretty much every three points of population right. lets you have another district right now. And so, you know, very soon, early in the game, you unlock four, five, six different types of districts. And if you only have cities that are population, yep. you know, three, you can't put them all in the same yeah, city. Yeah. So you're going to have to make decisions about what goes where. And those decisions are going to be based on the map because you're going to be saying, well, if I can only have one industrial zone, one production district, let's put it in a place where it's going to be really right. effective. Cool. Um, I, just to talk a little bit about, uh, about that demo that I played, actually, um, I ran into um, both Egypt and America. And in at least in the, the demo I played, uh, Egypt, 
uh, clearly that they have a, a, an agenda that you can see that they they don't like people with small, insignificant militaries, which right. I happen to have because I was playing a really boring game of just building things and well, having a nice time. There are a lot of people that do that with <laughs> yeah. a Civ Five game. They're like, ah, oh, the AI is not going to give me any trouble. I can get away with one or two units. I've been guilty of that myself. Sure. Yeah, and uh, it was nice to see that, like, directly. So Egypt declared war on me, and I I knew why it happened, which is, uh, I think, pretty important for the player. And also, as well as that, um, America, I think, um, got involved, like, uh, sort of. They didn't like that Egypt had declared war on someone on their continent. Exactly. Um, and, and yeah, we saw all these agendas coming into play. Yep. But as well as the, the agendas that you can see and you can understand, there's also a hidden agenda for each um, country or each nation. So the historical agenda is fixed and that always applies to that leader. So mm -hmm. that you kind of, um, I think it's important to have some sense of what the, these different leaders are. If it was all random, um, we, we have these wonderful discussions on our fan forums where they're like, which leader is the biggest jerk <laughs> that you absolutely love to destroy because he's giving you the most trouble in all sure. the games. So if we didn't have people like that, we didn't have agendas that kept coming back with the leaders, I think we'd lose some of that personality. Mm -hmm. But it's very interesting because there is a secondary thing that's also in play that's going to control if for that particular game something new that that leader is going to care a lot about. So, so if, for some, what, what some of those so an example could be... Could be um, that he wants to have the strongest navy in the world. Right, okay. Or he is going to go all out nuts on culture this game. Um, and we have a pool of those and they're randomly given out to the different leaders so that um, it's different every time you play. And so you don't know what that is and you have to work with what we call our diplomatic visibility system. Uh, that's a system that rewards you for getting to know the other yep. AI leaders in the game. Sure. So if, if you just ignore them and you never spend any time, send, even sending them traders or um, we have a diplomatic delegation, yep, which sure. is a gift that you can give them. You know, like, we're going to give you a sample of our wonderful... America gave me some apple pies yes, during my exactly. game, which I found hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we, we had, that's customized for each, nice. each civilization. Of course. So, um, you know, you'll get different things from yep. different people. Um, but if you if you engage with them like that, then all of a sudden you'll have people that are maybe living over in their city or traders that are going through their cities, and you'll be naturally getting what we call gossip back yeah, right. from that from that uh, leader. And through gossip, um, if you have a high enough level of visibility there, you can find out what their agenda is. Okay. But there's a lot more that you find out as well. You can find out what they're building when they have a new settler who's going to go out and form another city. Maybe even what their government is, what social policies they're running, right. which might tell you something about their strategy. Um, later in the game, you get spies that you can send in there, and okay. they can actually dig down to a, the top secret level, right, right. Gossip, sure. which includes military plans and, and game strategies and things like yeah, that. Yeah, so it, that covers everything that the AI is doing, right? Because I, I think even when other nations declared war on each other, I got that through the gossip yes, system. Yes, and so in Civ Five, there was a whole bunch of notifications as this flew by turn yeah. after turn on the right-hand <laughs> side of the screen. Sure. And um, yeah, some of those you don't care about because they were happening across the world, mm -hmm. but um, we've sort of entirely replaced that notification. I mean, there is a still a notification system, so if we need to tell you something that you need to deal with, we, we still send it to you through sure. a notification. But a lot of that kind of background chatter about what's happening in the game world all comes to you through gossip now. And uh, there are way more things that you can find out about than in Civ Five, but you don't find out about any of them without investing some of your intelligence, right. okay. uh, you know, dollars to, to sure. get that kind of information back. Cool. Um, now, something that, that has been a little bit de of debate over within the Civ community is the art itself of Civ Six. Um, it's quite a bit different to Civ Five, um, and some people love it. Some people think it's a bit too cartoony. Uh, uh, as the team kind of uh, looked to that feedback and. Um, has that influenced anything? We have looked at that feedback okay. and there are um, some subtle changes that have been made. Um, we're definitely concerned most with readability. Right. And um, even through comments, sometimes we get comments where like, you know, something was unclear to a fan, we were going to go ahead and take another look at that because maybe it wasn't done as well as it possibly could sure. be. But that's, that's the big reason that we have gone for a more stylized look is we wanted to make sure now, now there are 12 different types of districts that can be outside a city. Yep. And that's a lot of already 10, plus the, you know, the existing 10 or so improvements that we have in any of our games. Um, and all the wonders. There's, there's like 30, 40 different things that can be on a tile right sure. now. And being able uh, to 
quickly identify what they are. And also with the districts, you have to be able to identify what upgrade level they're at. You know, how many buildings are in there? Do right, you have right. the library and the university or just the library here? Sure. Um, and are they pillaged? Are they under construction? Um, we actually had a much bigger uh, effort putting in what we call the, our environment team. It's the one that does everything that is going to be out on the map. They had a much, much bigger job than they'd had in any of the previous right, okay. games because there's so <laughs> many different variations with the districts. Um, one thing we just announced yesterday is right. that we're going to have civilization unique districts. Sure. So we haven't even given an example of what one of those is, okay. but you can. One of the unique bonuses that civilization can have is a district. Um, you know, they get an enhanced version of the campus, right, or right. the industrial zone, something like that. That requires new artwork as well. Yep. So and that's uh, a lot of a lot of stuff for the player to kind of right. And if the player can't. Absorb. Yeah, pick that up right away, then that's going to hurt gameplay, and we didn't want to do that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so players have seen quite a bit of gameplay so far. Obviously, the after, since the trailer, we've seen um, some live streams, and uh, I think a couple of YouTubers have, have gone hands-on with um, like multiple turn games. Looking at that gameplay, looking at the stuff they've seen so far, what can what can the community expect to change before release? Like, How much is there still to go? On Civ 6? Well, really what we're doing now is we're working on the balance. Okay. Final balance everything. And it's a big job right. on a game like this. So we don't take that lightly. Um, the the AI will keep getting trickier and trickier. So, um, you know, I don't know whether you felt like it was giving you a tough time or not, but... <laughs> sort of. Uh, so Egypt had a problem with me and then America stepped in. I could sort of let That's them sort of handle that whilst I built yes. things nicely. <laughs> Yeah, um, and exactly how jumpy all the leaders are in okay. terms of diplomacy, that's definitely something that we, we sort out at this part of the project. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of, lot of um, refinement in terms of getting all the systems to interact with each other um, properly. Now, it's um, they're, they're different systems than we had for Brave New World, but I'd say like the overall complexity of the game is about the same right. as Brave New World was. So we're using some of the same techniques and tools that we had. Um, and then and some new tools as well that are going to help us even further to kind of get through all that balance part. Sure. But uh, yeah, I kind of this is a really interesting part of the project because it's sort of like the final magic has to get added to everything to make it all just come together right. So we're going to work on that. Absolutely. Yeah, balanced. I, I hear that's pretty. It's pretty intense. Yeah. Pretty tricky. And there'll be some things that were, you know, we did don't anticipate. Mm -hmm. Once we get millions of people playing the game, um, you, you're going to hit things that. Our testing staff just didn't think of. Sure. Um, so you don't want another Gandhi situation, yeah. <laughs> right? So we'll be supporting the game, you know, throughout, just okay. to make sure that um, it's always going to be a great experience for everybody. Absolutely. Well, as a strategy fan and a fan of Sean Bean, I'm <laughs> I'm really into Civ Six. Well, um, it's it's looking good. And I'm a huge Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, shop. Yeah, oh, everything. Yeah, well, it's, he's great in, in everything. Yeah, so. you need to keep hiring him to narrate things. That's <laughs> that's what I say. Okay, Ed, thank you so much for your time. Okay. There's no end to our imagination. And no limits. civilization.